Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and this is episode number four of the Books and Travel podcast. Today, I'm talking about Granada and Cordoba in Andalusia, southern Spain, with historical novelist David Penny. Now, David and I share an intense love of southern Spain in particular. And in fact, I almost moved to Spain in the year 2000 rather than go to Australia. I loved it so much and uh, features in a number of my books, a lot in Gates of Hell, uh, which is about Kabbalah and uh, the Jewish side of Spain. And then again in Valley of Dry Bones, which is very much about the Catholic history. And I think part of the romance of Andalusia comes from the smell of orange and citrus in the air and the sound of flamenco guitar and the exotic architecture that mingles the Middle Eastern and Moorish heritage with Catholicism. (laughs) Easy for me to say. (laughs) And of course, I find the very bloody history of Spain uh, almost constant inspiration for my writing. I, I always come back to the idea of faith and what people do in the name of religion. And it's it's a continual fascination for me and appears in pretty much all of my books. Now, I'm going to do a solo show on Spain at some point. But in the meantime, enjoy this interview with David. David Penny is the author of the Thomas Berrington Historical Mysteries set in Moorish Spain. Today we're talking about how his love of Spain features in his books. Welcome, David. Hi, Joanna. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, where are you in the world right now and what is outside your window? Okay, I am actually in Spain at the moment. Uh, we have, we, a couple of years ago, we bought a small house in Spain. So we come out here when the weather in England is too bad. And at the moment outside my window is lots of olive groves, almonds just coming into blossom. And it's about 19 degrees C, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> That's very pleasant. I, and I'm in England and of course it's a bit chilly right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> But that's awesome. So um, tell us a bit more about how you fell in love with Spain, because you're obviously British. And why did you decide to set your books there? OK, um, it, Spain was a very late discovery for me. Um, I came here and I actually visited the Alhambra at 16 years old on a school trip. And, and we, we, I think we had three days or three afternoons when we actually got off the boat, which was not much fun. But I distinctly remember traveling in a coach through what at the time looked like desert landscape for hours. And we got to the Alhambra Palace. And I, I do have pictures of it and I do vaguely remember it. But my abiding memory of that trip is you could go into a bar and you were 16 years old and 15 and you'd order a beer and they'd serve you. And it was brilliant. <laughs> Perfect. But, yeah. But then I never, we never visited Spain for another 40 years. And in fact, the ideas for the books I write came before we came back to Spain. So I, I, I'm not sure what was happening. I was sitting at home with the kids and my wife, and and for some reason I said, do you think anybody's ever written a detective novel set at the end of Moorish Spain? And they gave me this weird look, and and they said, why? And I said, well, I just got an idea for a 10-book series, and and it seems like a nice idea. Somebody must have come up with it before. And I took a look around, and nobody has. And I, I couldn't believe it because it is such a fascinating period in history and such an amazing place to write about. So that was the initial idea. I thought about it a little bit more, and then we booked a couple of, booked a flight and we came out. And I think we spent a week, maybe a little longer in Spain, in Barcelona and Granada and Cordoba, and visited the Alhambra. And I thought, yeah, this is going to work. <laughs> 
and that that's where it came from really and and the love of Spain was almost immediately immediate as a result of that it did, i mean we'd done Italy and france and and the usual places um and Spain just combined everything I liked about Europe in one place, and the longer I'm here, the more and more we fall in love with it. It's just such a a great place it's just such great people and a fantastic culture, even though strangely the Spanish don't particularly appreciate the Moorish culture that is all around them down here in the south. Mm. So give us some ideas of what that Moorish culture actually is. So if people go, well, even just talk about Andalusia, which is the yeah. the area we're yeah. talking about. But so be more specific about the area you're writing in. Yeah. Okay. So, well, it is Andalusia very much so. Um, I don't, my characters don't stray out of Andalusia at all. Not at the moment anyway, although I do have plans for that in the future. Um, and the starting point for the series of books, as well as the starting point for anybody who wants to know what Andalusia is all about, has to be Granada, of course. It was the capital of Islamic Al-Andalus uh, from about 1100 AD to 1492, when the Spanish sacked the city, they walked in and the then sultan handed over the keys of the palace and, and disappeared, never to be heard of again. And Granada is this, it, it's quite small, quite quite compact, um, the bits that you want to visit anyway. <laughs> uh, the rest of it is just a bit of an industrial city, because <laughs> I think you've been as well, haven't you? And it's um, Yeah, I was going to say, like, it, if, if people are going to go there, you can actually stay centrally and just walk around, can't you? Although it is yeah, quite a long hill up to the Alhambra. <laughs> it is quite a long hill, yeah. <laughs> and the other side as well. We fell lucky. We um, we found a lady who rented out apartments, and they are literally on the roadway that goes up to the Alhambra. So it's the, the two apartments, and you walk out of your front door and you turn left, and within five minutes you're at the gates of the Alhambra. You turn right, and within two minutes, you're in uh, the big square at the bottom, right in the center of the old city. And you can walk past all the cathedrals and into all the tiny little alleys and up onto the Albaycin, which is my second favorite place in Granada. Mm, and, that's and where it, the um, stone-cut uh, houses are, isn't it? Sort of houses into right. the rock. Yeah, yeah. And it's just a jumble, it, and it's tiny little alleys. You can't get cars up most of the places. You have to walk. And, and it's where it, they were, in effect, at the time I'm writing about, it, they were two different cities. And for most of the time, they were actually at war with each other. So it, some of the reason that, that the Moors were defeated in Spain has got very little to do with how good the Spanish soldiers were and more to do with infighting, which is probably typical of most um, civilizations and the way they end, to be honest. Mm. But yeah, sorry, Joe, were you going to say something? No, 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 carry on. Okay, okay. So Granada you have to do, but but learn some of the lessons. We we turned up in Granada and and said to Esperanza, oh, no, we're going to go up to the Alhambra tomorrow. And she said, ooh, have you booked? And we said, no. She said, oh, well, then it's this, you have to book a month in advance at least. And we said, oh, damn. And, and she said, unless you have a guided tour. So we I logged onto the internet and found a guided tour, and it was about five times the price. And to be honest, it was worth every penny we paid. It was fantastic. We had a, an Arabic guide, and he takes you into places that you, the general public can't go. But he's just so knowledgeable about it all and all the history of it and, and what happened and where things went on. Then what I tell people now is if they've never been to the Alhambra, they actually do pay for a guide and have them show them around because you get so much more out of it. that It's, it's amazing. Mm. And um, it just, the Alhambra is just an amazing place. It's, it's obviously a World Heritage Site. And it, is it one of the wonders of the world or something? I can't remember. Probably if it isn't, it should be. Mm, definitely. Uh, it's just totally otherworldly. And the fact that people live there and, and, May, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is unbelievable. And it's, 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 it's weird because I've quite often, I've had several emails and messages from people who have read my books 
And then they've written to me and they said, oh, they're so fantastic. We live in Alabama and we're flying to Spain next week to go and look at all the places you write about. <laughs> you think, oh, my God, no, that is humbling <laughs> and also what? a bit worrying. <laughs> Well, I think that's part of the reason I wanted to have these conversations because I find myself doing that. And also uh, I get the same emails about my books. And it's funny, you mentioned the Alhambra. I remember traveling there back when I was probably 18, 19 and uh, sitting in one of those cafes across the um, across the valley. Yeah, uh, You know, yeah. there's a few places you can sit there looking out and um, it just... It just it does evoke uh, history, and I did. I wanted to ask you about this because you write historical mysteries, and yet you you're writing now. So I'm very interested in this idea of seeing a place in time. Mm. So in Granada, obviously, you're seeing places that have existed over time, but life is very different. Mm. So how do you see these different levels of medieval Spain versus kind of modern Spain? How how do you research that time shift? Well, well, the research starts obviously with, with finding out what life was actually like back then. Um, and in my, in, in my case, that did give me some problems because a lot of the original texts no longer exist. So a lot of the stuff that was written contemporaneously would have been in Arabic to begin with. But when the Spanish defeated any particular city, for instance, when they, they, they moved into Cordoba, in, I think, 11-something, they destroyed the 3,000 books in the library there, and, and they were just gone. And the same in Granada when they took the city. So a lot of the original texts are gone, so you're relying upon second and third and fourth hand records of what's going on. So you start with reading up on, on, on the history, on the events, and then making copious, really copious notes, probably sometimes longer than the actual books that you've read. But then you have to put those into the context of, we obviously don't know what it was like living in those times, but we can imagine, we can place ourselves in our imagination into those times and see how we and other people might have reacted to what was going on. And of course, you don't want to write about... Um, times it was easy to live in you want to write about climactic periods of history mm -hmm. so that the more you know the more that is happening the more you're putting your characters under stress and into danger and that's what people want to read about they don't want to read about you know a nice guy who's got a family and and, and uh, nothing ever happens to them and it just goes on for about a hundred thousand words and then ends you know that's just, <laughs> i have i have yeah, read I books know. like that <laughs> I know what you mean, but it's interesting. I mean, like you say, one of the this is also a tumultuous period in history you're writing about. So, yeah. 1492, the expulsion of the yeah. Jews. So, I I write mm. a lot about that as mm. well. In in though I write modern day, but also the kind of the way history, um, you know, the way the Jewish diaspora, yeah. for example, yeah. based on the expulsion in 1492, and also what I find fascinating in Granada, like there are some really gory cathedrals oh, um, yeah, for yeah. this for the Spanish monarchs and, you know, some, um, so now it's interesting because of course you're talking about Moorish Spain when it was ruled by Muslims, which, um, and many people, uh, you know, sort of modern day Islam compared to what it was at that point in history is really interesting. So how do you write about, and actually it was the Christians who were the fundamentalists at yes, the time, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're destroying yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, what, what do you, what, I guess, what, what is so fascinating about this period in a religious sense? And are there any places that you like to um, write about in terms of that, that religious side? Yeah, I, I, I tend to always well there's always an element of religion comes into every single one of my books even though my main character is a non-believer like me he he tend you, you cannot um get away from the fact that religion is what ruled that period of time as you say even more so on the spanish side than the moorish side the moors were weird uh, they were islamic but they were actually poor muslims or oh, they had developed into poor Muslims by the time I'm writing about. They, they sort of came into Spain in 792, I think, on a tide of wild Islamic zeal, rode straight through the country. They got as far north as Poitiers. I think it must have rained and they decided they didn't like it and they withdrew. Um, but they, th that initial 
religious zeal wore off significantly as time went on. And the Islam of the 1300s, 1400s earlier was a very different thing to the Islam of today. Like you say, it has switched. We hear a lot about Islamic fundamentalism, but I've got friends who are Islamic and, and they're not fundamentalists. It's just part of their religion, part of their day-to-day life. Although, to be honest, I think they are more. Um, they do adhere to the strictures of their religion far more than uh, Christians do. And, you know, There's a lot of Christians in here and elsewhere who rarely go to church, whereas most of the most of the Muslims I know, even though they're not fundamentalists, they do tend to adhere to the prayer times and so on. But it, obviously it was a different period of history. And like you say, Spain was resurgent. And it, I, I just love the way that what, what happened with, during Spain fighting what they considered the Islamic invaders, although they'd been there 800 years, um, strengthened their fighting prowess so much that they became, with obviously Christopher Columbus and the discovery of the Americas, this almost unstoppable fighting force that was also pretty um, awful. You only got to look at what they did in a lot of South America and so on to, to see mm-hmm. that that was true. And a lot of that came from the ferocity of the fighting that was going on at the time I'm writing about. And it, it's just, it, you know, the ends of wars are always more interesting than the starts of wars quite often. And so I'm just writing about the last 10 years of that. And, you know, I said I had 10 books in mind when it came to it. I don't, in these, initially in that sort of nanosecond, I'm sure you've had these moments as well, Joanna. <laughs> You're sitting there and then, bam, oh, my God, that, that would make a book. And, and the... The initial idea was Christopher Columbus walking into the Alhambra to request the funds to sail across to discover a route to the Indies. Because uh, what I hadn't realized when that idea came is that Spain had been stringing him along for about 10 years and promising him a little bit and then withdrawing it and promising it. And he just got fed up with this. And he was going to go to France and get them to fund him instead. And then uh, they actually turned him down. And he got back as far as the gates of the gates of the city and thought, no, this isn't good enough, and went back and persuaded it. And in my vision of that scene, it's my main character who meets him at the gates and says, no, let's go back and I'll, I'll help you get them to give you the funding. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting how you can stitch history and fiction together. And that's what I love oh, doing, yeah. really. You know, it, it's, um, and for me, to be honest, it's the fiction that comes first. And I quite often subsume the history into it, even though you get it mm. as right as you can. If it's a choice for me between did this actually happen or would I have liked it to happen, I tend to go with the I would have liked it to happen right about now. Yeah, I mean, chances are it did happen because you don't, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, you can't, don't. we can't know about history. I you know, know, a lot of these people would not have been written about. But I do, no. uh, just coming back on places, I mean, places that are really interesting in that religious way, um, yeah. the, mesqui- the Mesquita oh, yeah. at um, Cordoba, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. which of course was a mosque and was yeah. turned into a cathedral. But wonderfully, they did like much of uh, the Christian... <laughs> and they did destroy it. So, um, and I've written about uh, that place in, in Gates of Hell. Um, you know, what, what is it? it do, have you written about Cordoba and that? Yeah. You know, what's fascinating? Yeah. That place yeah. yeah. My second book was set in Cordoba. Um, and there's, there's a couple of scenes specifically. You can't go to Cordoba and visit the Mesquite and not want to write about it because it's, it's the, one of the most amazing places I've ever been. You just walk through the doors and you think, "Um, sorry, is this meant to be a cathedral? (laughs) Yeah, what is this? It's amazing. It is. It's it's just it's just otherworldly, totally, you know. And just imagine what that must have been like when people did actually use it as a mosque. That is amazing. So yeah, my second book is set exclusively in Cordoba. And it it talks about that that dis disjointedness between the mesquita, the interior of it, the way that that, that Spain, the, the Catholic Church, they've they've just dumped a little altar in the middle of it, 
with a few chairs around it, and that is their, their, their attempt to turn it into a Christian cathedral. And that's what they did in all of the mosques when they took a, defeated the Moors. They put a little, little piece in the middle of them and then gradually either knocked them down. They left the mis- most of the mosquito in place, but they've, they knocked down the, the, uh, the mosque in Seville but kept part of it so that I think there's one corner of the, the cathedral in Sibir that is, that is still part of the mosque. And I actually make use of that in a later book as well. Mm. So it is, it's fascinating. There's just so many, there's all these different places and, and it's a kind of golden triangle really of Granada, Cordoba and Sibir. And then maybe include Malaga in one of the corners and Ronda, of course. You've, got to go. You've been to Ronda, Shona? I haven't been to Rondo, oh, but it's an area that yeah. I keep coming back to as well. It's kind of, I remember uh, being in Sevilla during one of the, you know, fiestas and yeah. the, the marching, all the people and the dancing and mm-hmm. the, the bulls and the, yeah. you know, the big uh, religious icons. But I want to, I mean, obviously we've talked about the Alhambra and the Mesquita, which are kind of obvious, you know, like you have to visit them, but they are kind of obvious places. Are there any sort of unexpected places or unexpected aspects of Andalusia that you think people might be surprised or kind of delighted to find out about i think both to be honest yeah <laughs> definitely surprised I, on my website i've started a, a blog thread and it's called beyond the beaches and the whole point about it is is to tell people that because you know people come to spain this is what put us off spain and what i didn't come for years and years and years is this image of benidorm and 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 the costas and lots of sand and lots of drinking and lots of shouting and fighting on a Saturday night. Uh, but the first surprising thing is it's not actually like that, not where we are. So if, if we go down to the coast on a Saturday night, there's a, to a place called Torre del Mar, which is our nearest seaside. It's just totally and utterly Spanish. And so it's, it's what a Spanish Saturday night is like, which involves lots of drinking but less fighting. And But, but Beyond the Beaches talks about if you drive – even five minutes inland from the costas, you find a totally different Spain. It's a, it's a Spain where nobody speaks English. And, and it's not just they don't want to speak English. Literally, we have a next-door neighbor we, we were trying to talk to yesterday because um, they keep giving us um, avocados and lemons and oranges and all sorts of things. So we make, made them a cake for Christmas. Well, for the three kings, it's the three kings here today or yesterday. Far more important than Christmas. And he doesn't speak a single word of English. And having conversations is difficult. But around here, nobody speaks any English. None of the Spanish people speak English at all. They don't even think about it. They weren't raised in it. The kids are taught it, but they tend not to use it. So mm. it's, quite, it's quite a shock because people go down to the coast and everybody speaks English. Everybody in the bars and the hotels and the shops has some English. You go that 10 minutes inland and that stops happening. And it, it's just a totally different land. And it's also very, very steep. It, our house sits on a hill. To walk the dog, we have to walk out the front door down a really steep hill. And then we have no option to, put, to go up another very steep hill in whichever direction we go. Well, it keep, keeps you fit. I mean, we did. We actually did a walk holiday around there in the uh, Alpujarra, which yeah. is near the, yeah. the edge of the Sierra Nevada. Yeah. And it is, you know, and you're, you know, you kind of walk up this incline you're through little rocks, and then there's an olive grove, and yeah. like you mentioned, the fruit. Like you know, you think of Spain, you do think sort of lemons and oranges yeah. and yeah. olives. Mm. Yeah, it, it's sad, really, because the the olives and the almonds, which are sort of natural trees to grow here because they require very little water, are all being rooted out and replaced by avocados and melons and, and papayas and things because they're, you can't make money growing olives anymore out here. And, and our neighbours just give us lemons and oranges because they get five cents a kilo for them if they try to sell them. So it's it's... It's a shame, really, you know, that um, – and then how much do you pay for extra virgin olive oil in Tesco's or something? It's ridiculous. No, is it – And I tell they're just giving but, it away. Yeah, I mean, some of the other – I guess you're talking about, like, some of the expectations of Spain, the kind of beaches and that type of thing. Yeah. Also, um, two things that people think of, I guess, are bullfighting and flamenco. Yeah. Now, yes. <laughs> bullfighting – 
completely gone, right? Bullfighting is now no, illegal. No, no, it's not. No. Okay, it's still legal. I think it's still legal. Is it Andalusia that's banned it or not banned it? I can't remember. Um, there's still bullfights in Malaga, so they can't have banned it. There's still bullfights in Ronda, where the claim is that that's where it started. Mm. Um, but but it's not like it used to be even ten years ago, and certainly not how it used to be fifty years ago. It's Spain is a weird country in that it keeps its its traditions pretty well, even the ones that are the, it's it's you know it's what it's like. It's, the world disapproves, so we're going to keep on doing it. But there isn't much bullfighting <laughs> anymore. Yeah, uh, oh, well, that, yeah. That, I mean, that's I've been to that bull um, ring yeah. in Malaga, and you're right; there were uh, young toreadors yeah. kind of practicing. But you, it does kind of make you feel sad in one way. It does. Uh, well, you know, yeah. quite sad. But the museum there, it really does make you f- feel uh, that things have changed. Yes. Um, yes. But I think the other thing that's really that, like coming back to flamenco, because mm. I've seen some really, really terrible <laughs> tourist related <laughs> flamenco. And then I've been in, I've been in a, I just remember one night in Sevilla, you know, there was probably some wine involved and the most incredible flamenco evening and that sense of duende, they call it, don't they? That yes. kind of the, the, the soul and of, of a people and just a very special time so um any thoughts on on flamenco oh yeah yeah it, uh, funny enough we were in um, malaga on friday i think yeah i bought myself a, a spanish guitar to learn some flamenco oh wonderful because <laughs> i didn't bring one out with me so uh, that's that's going to be interesting um uh, uh, but yeah we uh, in exactly the same way as you uh, you tend to find a lot of the tourist oriented flamenco some of it can be very good but a lot of it is is done to a purpose and, and and it's just given lip service really. But we've had some amazing experiences. The first first time we came to Spain, first time we saw we were in Granada, and we asked our landlady, where can we go and see some real flamenco? And she said, Well, if you want to see the real flamenco, you go to this place down at the bottom of the Albays Inn. And we, so we went and it was twelve euros for the the show including wine uh, and you're supposed to get one glass but somebody must have forgotten that because they're just bottles getting had left right and center <laughs> and it was in a tiny little cellar that held about 40 people and obviously they realized we were the, the suckers so we they sat us in the front row <laughs> which means you get spat on by the singers. <laughs> 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 and that was unbelievable it, it, and uh, and the guitarist was sort of middle aged. The, the singer was like he'd just come out of the hills a hundred years ago. You know, he just walked in with dusty boots and dusty clothes, and and really, it it's a very otherworldly experience. Yeah, for it Michael, is. Isn't it's, it? I just found it kind of magical in that way. But um, a couple more questions. So. Uh, like we've mentioned some of the eating and drinking, um, but I do <laughs> yeah. wonder if you could particularly recommend uh, anything, uh, if people are in the area, any wine they should drink, any particular food they should try. Again, everyone goes, oh, paella. But, no, um, no, 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 know, no, 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 exactly. <laughs> couple, a couple of things in the food line. One is espetos on the beach. Um, but apparently only have them if there's an R in the month. The espetos are sardines on a skewer. Mm. And you, know, you go along the beach, you know, in, all around here anyway, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but they have these upturned boats filled with uh, coals, barbecue coals. And they put half a dozen of these sardines on, a skewer, stick them in the coals, and then five minutes later they take them off, cover them in salt, and stick them on a table with some bread and olive oil. And those are absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> Um, but why, the reason you have to have them with an R in the month is that that's when they're local. They do them all year, but outside. So now if we went had to have some now, they would be imported sardines and they're not a patch on the real ones. So espetos on the beach, definitely. Um, any wine, to be honest, in a, in a restaurant is better than anything you're going to buy below £20 in a, in a supermarket in England. Um, mm, I mean, you mean like table wine? I mean, yeah. I would just order what I said, yeah. local. That's wine. what we do. Yeah, kind of- yeah. But that, that doesn't have a name. It's just it's just the local wine. Um, you have to be a bit careful because around here they have this very sweet Malaga wine, and and 
to our taste, is almost undrinkable. It's 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 very very sweet indeed. So you have to be careful. Our neighbours, first time we met our neighbours, he was drinking from a, like a flagon, this wine, and he, he offered me some, and I lifted the flagon, you're not allowed to drink, touch it, and poured it all down my shirt, and um, he didn't offer me a second time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, I mean, you also, just thinking about tapas, we actually yeah. went to one of the best tapas bars that we'd ever been to in um, in Malaga. I'm yeah. going to have to put the link in the show notes, because yeah. I can't remember the name, but it was um, mush. we had like a a mushroom and some asparagus, like just a fresh vegetable yeah, kind yeah. of done in a simple way, I think mm. are, are really amazing. Mm. Yeah. If you go to a bigger city, you get some really interesting tapas. But but out here, it's it's just, you know, it tends to be the same sort of things. You get meatballs and, and anchovies and, and fish and pork and whatever. But what what is amazing is you go out around here in the small towns and you order a tapas and – uh, a drink. Well, you order a drink and the tapas comes with it. You don't have to ask for it. <laughs> and you go to pay and you find out it's a euro for the wine and the tapas. Mm. Uh, it's, you, you know, you don't have, you can eat for about six euros all night long. And and what if you come out, people have to go and do the menu de la dia, the, the daily lunchtime menu. It's three course meal with a drink and it's eight euros. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the the life's the lifestyle is very different as well, and you, you have this sort of idea that Spain is different, but you don't realize how different it is until you have to live here. And and you know, we didn't in the UK we're spoiled. You go out, and every day is a day you can go to the shops. In Spain, from Saturday lunchtime until Monday eight a.m., everything is shut. <laughs> that's because they're having a good life <laughs> it is yeah yeah they enjoy life you know and and life is more important than than commerce i think in some in, and things like we're used to amazon next day delivery <laughs> you do not get that in spain <laughs> three weeks every <laughs> if you order anything it's always three weeks and it's coming from madrid i mean madrid's four hours up the road I was going to say it's not that far. You'd be better to to drive yeah. to a lockbox. No. But it's it is interesting. But you you know the trade off as you you know your the trade off is a slower pace of life. Yes, which is um, nice. Which kind of yeah, which is and whenever I arrive, I mean we 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 come to Spain quite a lot, and <laughs> I was just I relax. I feel like I'm on holiday in Spain. I really do. Like I I um my husband is. I think I emailed you and I said, well, we'd like you know we're thinking about living in Spain, and then I just went, do you know what? I'd never do any work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can remember. I can remember meeting you in London at after LBF, and we went for a meal with Orna and others. And we, I was walking with you, and I couldn't. I had to run. <laughs> you just walk so fast, Joanna. <laughs> and and you find that in Spain, I don't in to, Spain. No, no, everything yeah. is just so slow. You know, the, the locals just, and it is a it's a local thing. All of everywhere you go now, if we will go out at about five o'clock. You see the locals, and they go, ah, paseo, paseo, and, and they just walk. Morning and evening, whatever age people are, they just walk, and they just go for a little walk along the road and then walk back home. Mm. And I think it's why Spain, I think does Spain have the longest average lifespan of any European country? I'm sure it does. Mm, I think it's definitely. second to Japan or Korea or something. And you can see why. they just <laughs> There isn't much stress out here. <laughs> No, it's pretty relaxed. Yes. So um, uh, we're almost almost uh, finished, but uh, I wanted to ask, like, why uh, do you travel and what does travel bring to your writing and or your life? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, we used to travel just to travel and now I travel with a purpose, which is quite a nice thing. And I enjoy that more than traveling without a purpose. So almost everything we do now, everywhere we go, it's it's because I want to research a book I'm writing. So, you know, we've been to Naples and Rome and Avignon, Carcassonne and, and lots and lots of places in Spain. And generally the impulse for that is, oh, I, I would like to write about, I want to use a location there and so I'm going to go to it. So I think before we start, I was talking about, um, I want to do a cozy mystery series and I'm going to set it in a theme park in America. So I've never been to America before. So now our plan is to go and spend two or three weeks out there and do a little bit of research. And of course, 
it's great for a writer because most research is mostly tax deductible. So. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> and we should we should also point out that you're are you, are you semi retired? Would you say you're semi retired, or are you absolutely retired? I'm officially apart I'm, from writing. <laughs> I'm officially officially retired, uh, but I work longer hours than I did when I was working. <laughs> so <laughs> on, on your writing, business. yeah, but it's not what you know what it's like, Joanne. It's not mm. work, is it? It, it can be tough and it can be dispiriting at times, but it's always fun. And I just yeah, love it. Exactly. I just love writing and, and, you know, I just sit here and do it far too much for my wife's liking sometimes. That's, I don't know if you have the <laughs> well, same. I haven't seen you all day today and you're still in the office. <laughs> well, once your, um, once your American book comes out, you'll have to come back on the show. Um, but, but for now... <laughs> Are there um, are there any other books um, you would recommend to give people a taste of Andalusia, whether that's nonfiction or fiction? Yeah, I'm going to plug some friends of mine here in a way because um, there's a, there's three people I know who about the only other people I know that do write about the same time period. So we set up a little Facebook group called Al Andalus Authors, and each of us write about Moorish period some you know all sorts of different times um and also a couple of them write about contemporary spain and, and in particular the great untalked of topic out here which was franco and the civil war they simply do not talk about it out here at all you can ask them a question and they won't discuss it but there are three three other people one of them is is a lady who we visit quite often because she lives not far away and she's joan fallon who writes about Cordoba in the time of the Moors and um, also about Civil War stuff. Another one is Lisa J. Yardy, Yardy, who writes about uh, a Sultana series of books set in in Moorish Spain. And then there's a guy called John D. MacDonald, who is far and away the cleverest of this small group uh, and lectures on history. So I I hope he never looks at my books because my history leaves a bit to be desired. But they're all, they all write about this region and different periods of time in this region. Fantastic. So just tell us uh, again about your own books. Yeah. Um, the books I write at the moment, are they're, they're called the Thomas Barrington Historical Mysteries. They're set in southern Spain, obviously. <laughs> but the, the guy is an Englishman from Leinster in the, in the Midlands who finds himself accidentally orphaned. Well, not accidentally orphaned, but orphaned in France, um, and ends up training to be a surgeon in, in Malaga. And he detects crime alongside his, his, his Watson uh, friend, who is a six-foot palace eunuch called Jorge. It's a buddy, it's a buddy which movie. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. And um, I will link to all of these in the show notes. So where can people find you and your books online? Online? Well, they, they can go to the website. So if, they will always find me through the website, which is davidpennywriting.com. Or I'm, I'm, ex- I'm exclusively on Kindle. So if they go onto Amazon, they will find me. And interestingly, over, over the last couple of years, if you type my name into Google, I'm the first whole page, which is, is brilliant because I haven't done anything to do that. <laughs> You've written a lot of books, books, David. I've written a lot of books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, that might be yeah. something to do with it. <laughs> it is, yeah. Just about to finish the seventh, so uh, yeah, it's lots of books. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, David. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.